Today we're going to talk about red flag laws and how if you support them, you're, you're not that, that bright and you don't really understand history and human nature and power and government, what the state is and what it does. The red flag laws, for those of you that are not familiar, are essentially the idea that the government can be told by citizen A that citizen B is a threat to themselves or others, that they're, they're a whack job. And then the government will, in all of its great fairness and objectivity and benevolence, honestly objectively evaluate that person. And if in fact that person is a danger to themselves or others, that the government will then raid their house or wherever it is that they are and use force, use violence to apprehend them and put them into a cage. Now, I know that Donald Trump said that, uh, and he's currently the, the, uh, the U.S. voters, he's, he's their president right now, uh, it's 2019, and he has said, let's not really worry about all the legalities. If we have any concern that the person's a, a danger, then we need to get them, you know, right away, get them into that cage so that they can't hurt anybody. So whether or not you're more of the U.S. Constitution kind of person that, that thinks that there should be due process, or if you're more of a... Uh, I don't know, Democrat slash Republican that supports Trump or or any of the other politicians, uh, Republicans or Demopublicans or whatever they call them. If you support any of those folks, then I, I get that we're kind of starting out with a different worldview. We have a different foundation. But for those of you that believe in the U.S. Constitution or believe in natural, basic human rights, natural law, then you kind of have to, I think, come to a similar conclusion as to my conclusion that red flag laws are an absolutely horrible idea. And while perhaps in an academic setting, we could, we could think that we were going to put so many checks and balances into place that it would really, truly only stop the people that were going to to commit these mass stabbings or uh, like in Southern California some years ago, somebody took a huge truck and just ran over a bunch of people. If we knew it was going to stop a mass killing like that and it wasn't going to infringe on anyone else's rights ever, then maybe we could academically argue that maybe kind of sort of it should work. But we could only do that if we completely ignored history. If we didn't know the nature of governments and what governments do and have always done. Not some governments, but all governments. Governments are not a control mechanism on themselves. They control you, their subject. They don't control themselves. Much like cancer cannot write a sticky note that says cancer is bad and cancer will not grow and then stick it on itself and expect it not to grow. Cancer grows. Government grows. Government can write a little sticky note that a lot of places, constitutional republic, like North Korea has a constitution that grants people many, many of the similar rights, similar rights to the United States, another constitutional republic with a constitution. They've both written these little sticky notes and put it on themselves, the government, the state, that says, don't grow. And they grow. Oh, and they also say, don't take away those rights that we're talking about in this sticky note. And they take away those rights. That's what governments do. And the serious observer of human nature and the person who has studied some history knows this. And they also know that governments are not pure and good. And the kind of people that are drawn to government leadership positions and government enforcement positions are not the true 
sweetheart, objective, fair, kind, benevolent, justice-seeking kind of people that we like to fantasize that they are. This red flag law, this concept, is an absolutely brilliant idea for anybody that wants to disarm a populace and a group of their subjects. It's absolutely brilliant. And the people that really truly want the people disarmed are not really speaking out. They have been smart enough to simply prod useful idiots. And when I say useful idiots, I'm talking about politicians, celebrities, people that, that think that guns should only be in the hands of, of the government, uh, people that can be trusted with them, the government. These people are not coming up with these ideas on their own. They're being manipulated into learning about them and then thinking about them and contemplating from a lot of different angles. And then they all come to the same conclusion that their masters wanted them to. Just as many of you watching this are probably Trump supporters, and you think that you know, you're watching Fox, which doesn't really pick sides, they're just fair and balanced, and they love, they love their government troops and their, their government police, um, and they're, very, they're about the only people defending them, and, and you're all for that, and we have to have order, and the government needs to enforce this order, and taxation should be very minimal, unless it's being spent on killing brown people or caging brown people. Now, I know I'm sounding like a liberal to some of you right now, and I guess I am kind of a classical liberal, which is nothing like today's liberals, but I, I do have a bit of classical liberal uh, tendencies, uh, but this is from, from way back, thus classical, instead of contemporary. But that's a, that's a digression. You both, on, on, you think you're on different sides, which is why I'm saying both. You're really pretty much on the same side. Just slight differences. But you lefties and your righties, unfortunately, you're falling for some stuff. And you're falling for this idea that, well, if Donald Trump and the NRA support red flag laws and background checks, more thorough background checks, then, you know, maybe I can get behind it because it's, you know, sometimes you have to compromise and, and Beto, Puto, whomever wants to take all of our guns and what's better than that? Mm. No, this is a, this is a matter of, of principle when you're talking about guns. Because what's a gun really? A gun is a, a tool that can be used for a, a variety of things. It can be used as a paperweight. It can be used to herd Jews up and put them into cattle cars. It can be used by a woman to keep herself from being raped and sodomized and then having her throat cut at the end of a torturous night of sexual assault. It can be used by governments to take lands away from some people and give them to other people. It can be used by police officers to shoot people that are growing marijuana plants. It can be used in a lot of different ways. One of the most popular uses is as a tool of personal protection or neighborhood protection. And that is what the Constitution, and again, I'm not into constitutions. I'm not into little slips of paper that various governments write pretending that they are going to live by them. But, but I know that many of you are into that. So I'm, I'm using this verbiage. The Constitution, the Second Amendment, the United States Constitution, that says that people can have guns, it, it wasn't written so that people can go duck hunting or deer hunting. It was written so that they could shoot government agents that were trying to take away their freedom. That's why it was put in there. There were a lot of documents surrounding the, the short, sweet, simple Constitution, constitutional amendments, Declaration of Independence, there were a lot of other documents that are well worth investigating. Federalist papers, anti-federalist papers, many letters written back and forth that better explain the intent behind what is very clear language. So whether you believe in the constitutional angle or the human rights natural law angle or, or some other angle, 
A gun is most frequently used by private citizens as a tool of personal protection. And the idea that a government could be supported by anyone when that government wants to go and take away this tool of personal protection from someone, anybody that supports any, any aspect of that, you might be right, but we're certainly in huge, huge philosophic opposition on this point. There's now I could almost I could almost see it if you said that that neighborhood, uh, the wise man of the neighborhood, the elder of this little clan of three families living together, or if you said the minister of a, a, a local uh, monotheistic uh, organization could could you know maybe make these decisions. So in other words, if you're worried about Bill down the street going on a on this rampage where he's gonna gonna shoot people with his with his over under shotgun, you could then go to the local minister and say, "Hey, I'm worried about Bill doing this," and then the minister could, in their great wisdom, which I, I would really, even though I'm not a, a, a religious person, I would much sooner trust a religious person. Uh, an elder in a in a group than I would a government, and I know what you're thinking. Yeah, but what about them Islams? Well, yeah, the sheiks and the the ministers and priests and such they're all they're all capable of being corrupt and and of being dogmatic, uh, and maybe many are dogmatic, but gosh, I, I still think religions have caused fewer wars and deaths and 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 assaults on on human life and and freedom than have churches. The state is much more to blame than, than religions. So if I was going to let anybody do it, maybe I'd let the local minister do it. Or some local respected guy in the neighborhood that everybody goes and asks them, hey, what do you think about blah, blah, blah. And everybody kind of thinks they give good advice. Maybe that person, but no, not even those people. So much less a government. Just because you happen to like one of the people that are in the, the figurehead position of a state, of a government, just because you happen to like the person that's temporarily there, doesn't make it okay to have a tool of defense taken from a woman that could later defend herself with that tool if she'd been allowed to keep it. If you take that gun from her, whether five minutes before she's raped, five seconds before she's raped, or five years before she's raped, you're a jerk. And I know what you're thinking. Perhaps. I don't know what you're thinking. I'm guessing what you're thinking. I'm guessing you're thinking, yeah, but how many women really protect themselves from rape each year? And we have to look at it statistically. And if only 3,000 women are going to get raped each year because they can't use a gun to defend themselves, and the criminals know this, if it's only 3,000 women a year and 4,000 people are getting killed, you know, murdered a year with a gun that, that innocent people are getting murdered. And I'm not just saying business competitors, you know, having a shootout with each other, uh, which a lot of shootings are gang warfare, but we're talking about innocent people, the little, the little person, just the little girl in the park minding her own business that gets shot. If we find that the number outweighs the number of rape victims by one, should we then say, Okay, now I can see taking all of the tools of defense from the rape victims. No, that that doesn't make sense. And I know what some of you are thinking is, there are other tools. Like, <laughs> there's not some government in the U.S. It's a free enough place still that it's not like there's going to be some government that's going to go and and make some local rule that the, the woman can't carry a knife or, or a taser or pepper spray or something like that. I mean, there's no place it's going to do that. Well, the Constitution wouldn't allow that, so... If some little municipality or state or county tried to make a rule saying that you can't carry a knife around, the feds would certainly swoop in. I, I have friends that are oath keepers, and these people have sworn to uphold the Constitution. And if any jurisdiction anywhere in the United States tried to tell people they couldn't have a knife, a butcher knife or a hunting knife they could carry around, I am absolutely certain these oath keepers would jump in their cars and head straight there and put those politicians in their place. So obviously nobody is suggesting that knives are taken away from people or, or 
pepper spray or, or that kind of thing or, or tasers. So I, I guess I kind of misspoke when I said no means of defense. People would still have those means. You'd have to be a lunatic to try to take those from people. But getting back to the guns, this, this red flag idea is, is horrible. It's an excuse. Um, it, it, it's not going to work in the way that you, if you're watching this, thinks it's going to work. It's going to work in the way that the government would like it to work. They're going to have a populace that isn't armed and is more docile. It's definitely going to work there. They're going to have much less chance of somebody opposing a new law, a new tax. It'll work in that sense, but it's not going to reduce the number of people getting killed. And if it does, is that really the ultimate? I've rambled a bit, and I hope I've been objective. If I am inaccurate, incorrect, and in fact, any government ever has been trustworthy, and in fact, it's okay for governments to take guns from people, let me know. Perhaps I'm wrong. I don't think I am. I think if you support the NRA, or Trump, or Beto, or Feinstein, or anybody else who tries to disarm you, or your neighbors, you are part of the problem. Mm -hmm.